This is Designing the Revolution. It's add-on episode number three, Alienation. And yes, uh, if you saw my last episode, I've sprained my leg, I'm on my back, and um, hence me being back in bed, as it were. All right. <clears throat> yes, alienation. Let me look at my notes. <laughs> So the next two add-on episodes are really coming out of this zone of politics and really situating ourselves in the big, the big questions of human existence. And the main proposition I want to make is a lot of political people, and this is why they're called political people, and that includes me and maybe a lot of you listening, one of the big problems and one of the big criticisms of people like this, of, of us, is, is they make the whole world political. And, and then they pretend that the world they've created is the actual world, where what they've done is They've been biased. They've said the real world is political. And then they put everything into this world. And by making the world political, they've just left loads out. And it's a bit naff, really, because the world's full of really big problems. And, yeah, they are political in a sense, but in an important sense, they're not as well. And this is the, this is the reason I'm doing these add-on episodes is is to be anti-utopian. This sort of Western modernist idea that you take society and you make it into something and it's going to be perfect and it's going to be perfect forever <clears throat> because of certain ideological, you know, prejudices you have. It doesn't exist in the real world. You know, it's a mental frame. It's part of this mechanistic, top-down, rationalistic thing we've been talking about in all these episodes. So there's like hard problems of living, as you, as you might say. And the main thing I'm going to talk about in this alienation episode is really like how we might wish to in, integrate, integrate the political with the social and with the existential. And we're going to play around with this. We're not going to be totally successful, right? Because there's hard problems here, as there has been in other episodes. And this is going to lead us, <coughs> sorry, this is going to lead us on to the final episode, which is really the sledgehammer that's going to destroy everything <laughs> that I've been saying in a sort of masochistic sort of way. So make sure you listen to the last episode. This is on transcendence. All right. So let's look at this this notion of alienation. Alienation has been a concept which has been thrown around for quite a long time, you know, certainly in the modern period, which is one of these sociological phrases, which basically means people are pissed off. <laughs> you know, uh, It's not going that well. I'm alienated. Things are not as they should be. So the whole political project, the whole political revolutionary project, and the social and the political questions, which we've done in the last two episodes, They've really been saying, look, there's power, there's the elites. We need to have this revolution. We need to get rid of the elites. We need to introduce democracy. And there's no question that there's something real called political alienation, which is there's people in charge, they're taking my money. There's people in charge, they're treating me like an idiot. You know, there's tyranny. People are getting shot. It's not good. I'm alienated. We need to have a revolution. Totally fine. No question about it. That sort of stuff's going on. And it's always going on. The problem comes where you go, that's the only sort of alienation. And all the other alienations have to fit into that frame. So there's two other sorts of alienations, arguably. I mean, you can construct this in different ways, uh, of course. So I'm going to introduce this notion of like social alienation. There's political alienation and then social alienation. What's that? Well, you could start, I suppose as a lot of people do, with Durkheim, who's a 19th century French sociologist. So what he was saying is, is alienation, yeah, it's rooted in politics, but it's primarily rooted in modernity. 
in other words, modern society. So you had the old society, you know, which was small and religion and all the rest of it. And now you've got this mass society, you've got the alienation of bureaucracy, um, you've got, yeah, you've got the problems with inequality, but more, it's more to do with the nature of society itself, with industrialization, with the state, uh, the bureaucracy, as I said. And what this does is it separates people. So you've got this idea of anomie, I think you pronounce it, where you've got the individual, the individual has been separated from the community. Uh, and paradoxically, at the same time, you've got the notion of the mass society. Everyone's fitting into big political parties, big trade unions, big religions, big states, and you have these big identities. And again, there's an intrinsic alienation in that because you don't actually, you're not getting your needs for community, for connection fulfilled. And there's endless books on all this sort of stuff. And some of it's quite romanticist in the sense that it's subliminally or explicitly harking back to a golden age where everyone's connected. And, you know, it's got a lot going for it. And it's got a lot not going for it. <laughs> but what's pretty convincing about this literature is is it's not all politics right it's about the deep structure of society and how to politically deal with this is really problematic because how do you deal with bureaucracy well okay you're going to get rid of bureaucracy but then you're going back to a fairly simple society or maybe you can move forward and use you know information technology the internet and such like to simplify it but as everyone watching this knows right bureaucracy has not gone away I mean I could say from my personal experience one of the things that the, probably the thing that makes me most annoyed most often is filling out forms you know it's like I don't want all this I just want to get on with my life all this sort of stuff and this alienation of course can go both ways it can go into a left-wing critique or a right-wing critique like just this this week you've had, we've had big farmers demonstrations around Europe and people are going I'm dying from all the weight of the bureaucracy and if anything that's going towards a right-wing popularism romanticism direction that somehow we can change society and have scapegoats like migrants and this is going to be fine oh well good luck with that you know all right, so then you've got, you know, a whole bunch of problems, yeah, with the social thing. But then it slides into this existential, impersonal, sort of perennial situation. So you've got the political, that sort of fades into the social, and the social fades into the uh, existential. In other words, there's not really hard boundaries. But the, you can identify the perennial problems which people have been talking about, you know, for 10,000 years, way before modernity, you know, the problems of life and death. What is life? Why am I going to die? The problems of, of the process of life itself, the challenges of childhood, of youth, finding a partner, the sufferings of life, you know, disease, people dying, the dynamics of loss, and then this whole theme through life of wanting love, wanting recognition, wanting status, wanting purpose, meaning the intersection between this and the religious impulse of is there some greater meaning, right? Everyone knows all this stuff. Everyone thinks about it all the time. You know, they might put it in different words. This is existential alienation. And dare I say it, People have come up with solutions, but it's pretty obvious no one's come up with the final solution to this sort of stuff. And so, just to come back to this, this notion, you've got this political, like, colonising, the political colonising, the social alienation, and the political colonising the existential, and saying, oh, you know, once we have perfect communism, you won't be... You won't be worried about finding a partner. You won't be afraid of death. Mm, probably not. <laughs> um, all right, so with this revolution in the 21st century, 
there's a few we've got a few ideas right we've got a few cards in the pack as you might say um and it really has to do with reconstructing the political into a holistic project which is centered around balance and this is a central theme of these episodes so we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater the political the concept of the political is important there is power it needs to be dealt with and at the same time it needs to be integrated into a way of designing society and social processes which bring everything together uh, bring these three forms of alienation together and respects their autonomy that they can't just be subsumed into another uh, uh, you know one of the other elements and you know incidentally this has happened the other way around like you know in some societies the political is colonized by the religious and the, it, everyone says it's all about God you know <laughs> it's like no it's not it's that guy wants to do me over uh, there's a secular explanation of what's going on uh, the political does exist separate to the religious as you might say so I've got two other little points here before I come on to solutions but when we actually look in detail about how design works the big problem is unintended consequences and this is why we need to have holistic design. There's no point going, hey, we're sorting that little area out and then you're patting yourself on the back. You need to be going, I'm sorting that little area out and now I'm going to look for all the consequences of that. And as we've been saying, we've got this notion of society as an organic whole, right? You know, not in a romantic sense, but in a, a realist sense. You know, it's a complex system. Everything actually does connect with everything else pretty quickly particularly in a system as complex as modern society and so let's let's just take a little example here so you have socialism socialism in its classical form as you might say is is the political proposition in its most extreme form is saying the political exists the political needs to be sorted out and the political is going to sort out all the problems of society and when you look at a lot of the people that have opposed socialism I'm, t I'm thinking here about Catholicism in in the 20th century you know in France which is one of the things I've been looking at it sounds all a little bit like academic but I think it's interesting which is the reason why these conservative Catholics did were opposed to socialism wasn't so much because of socialism's strength i.e there's injustice we need equality the rich need to pay their taxes you know people need to get the benefits of their labor yeah yeah that's all well and good but that's not all that socialism was if they were being honest socialism had a philosophy had a metaphysics it had a worldview it had this mechanical reduction of society into material forces and it was aesthetically and philosophically ugly because what the conservative Catholics were saying and their strong point was no what what socialism is doing is destroying organic community the actual community where you're going down the road and you get your bread and you have a chat with the baker and all this sort of stuff which modern scholarship has shown is massively important for mental health for instance and then this notion of enchantment that the world is alive with spirits and traditions and ceremonies and celebrations and community events and people get together like socialism hasn't got much to say about that at least in its you know purest form now you know there are traditions of socialism you know social anarchism for instance where people are sort of investigating this and there's certainly a, a sort of romantic socialist tradition but as it start to manifest itself in the 20th century you know it had this quite vicious totalitarian element so I'm not saying like socialism's crap obviously I'm not saying the conservative Catholics are great certainly not <laughs> what I'm saying is is the social and the existential has it has to be taken into account right you can't just have this reductive left-wing ideology just flying around society with this 
you know, hegemonic arrogance. There's more stuff going on. So in the 21st century, we're looking at, you're looking at a certain degree of humility, com sophistication, complexity in, in how we're going to construct the new ideology, as you might say. All right, so let's look at some partial solutions to the alienation problem to finish off. Yes, obviously, equality, right? For the political alienation. Yes, obviously, good governance for the political problem. The political problem. No one's disputing that. But then when we're looking at the social, you know, the social alienation and existential alienation, we're sort of back in this theme, aren't we, of sociability, which is how do we bring the process of social connection down into the social space? What is happening 10 meters from me? What's happening in my village, my neighborhood, my street? And then into the time, you know, it's in time. What's happening next week? What's happening over the next month? How can I control that environment? How can I co-create it with other humans in that in that situation? What are the modules of connection? You know, getting together, having food and such like. What are the things that bring people together where money isn't that important? Yeah, money's always going to have some importance, you know, economic autonomy uh, and power and what have you. But it's in this ballpark, right? And a lot of these episodes have really been trying to deal with this problem of modernity, the problem that Durkheim, you know, initiated and has spawned this massive literature about, you know, what it is to live in modern society. But I'm going to criticise it to, to end as my little final comment in this episode. And again, you know, I've got this notion of hard problem, right? The hard, the hard problem of politics. There's also the hard problem of social design. Yeah, you can bring all these people together and they're all going to socialise. Cool, right? And I'm not saying that doesn't have an autonomous sort of benefit. But impinging on this is this notion of values. What actually are people going to believe? People do believe in things. They have to have values. Which ones are the best ones? And this is a hard problem, right? And it's it's connected with this notion of postmodernism, where people are saying, "Well, you know, these values they're just they're just values for this particular group, this particular period, this particular culture." And to concretize this a little bit, I just want to like say, you've got this theme running through through sociability design, which is. Are you going to have Christian values or are you going to have Nietzschean values? I mean, there's different words for these, but there's two basic paradigm of meta values. So the Nietzschean value is, or the Republican value, as I might call it, is, you know, people need to be strong. They need to get on with it. We need to be super, super men, you know, super women. We need to pursue our dreams. Uh, we need to go for it. We need to be hard. You know, we don't want to be into pity and all this sort of stuff. And it has a lot going for it, you know, because, as Nietzsche said, this is this is not a slave uh, ethical system, right? We're not going, oh, my God, I'm terribly sorry. We're going to go, no, 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 I've got one life. I'm going to make it great. I'm going to do great, great art. I'm going to do great politics, you know. I'm going to lead the revolution. It's an energy, and it's got a lot going for it. And... It's opposed, as you might say, to this Christian ethic, which isn't, you know, lots of people have said the Christian ethic isn't, it's not about Christianity anymore. It's imbued in our, our culture, in Western culture, and arguably in global culture, which is this notion of justice, you know, looking after the poor, compassion, uh, caring for each other, um, looking after the weak, fantastic stuff. And there's just that awareness is not the only game in town. And it has these dysfunctionalities of, you know, fetishizing vulnerability, victimhood, and not really getting a grip with the fact that life is hard and you just need to get on with it, for instance. So I'm not saying, like, 
either of these are good or bad, but I'm saying like, this is a hard problem, right? You know, you're going to find it really difficult to basically create a set of values, which is going to um, create a stable sociability. I'm not sure what to do about that one. <laughs> and then the, with modern scholarship, there's this notion that of biology coming back into the social, where people are saying, well, actually, conservatives, conservatives aren't social constructs. In other words, so conservatives are not, are not made conservatives because they've got conservative parents and they go to a conservative university and the church tells them to be conservative. Like, yeah, yeah, that's all important. You know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And it's definitely there, environmental determinism. And at the same time, conservatism, you know, reduced into what you might call a suspicion of risk, you know, a careful personality. It does impinge on this notion of impersonality, which which comes from some notion of genetics and people, some people, as we all know, <laughs> you know, it's common sense. Some people are naturally conservative. Some people are naturally risk taking. That is difficult to reduce down to social determinism. Why isn't everyone like that or not? Um, so there's a normal distribution, in other words, you know, most people in the middle and you've got these people on the, on, on the extremes. So in terms of design, you've got a problem because you can't please everyone all of the time. So these, these are hard problems, right? And I'm not, you know, I'm not raising them in order to be able to go, okay, you know, let's settle for that. What I'm saying is we need to be consciously incompetent, this phrase I used in the last episode, which is we need to be aware of the intrinsic ling limits of our design agency. In other words, we need to be humble revolutionaries. Yes, we're going to make massive advances and it's going to be exciting. And at the same time, we're reading the conservative critique literatures and we're going, yeah, 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 they've got a point. And by being conscious of incompetence, of our limits, we actually maximise the ability to make progress. We don't become, you know, apathetic. We actually um, become more effective because we're, we're aware of those limits. Okay. So, in the last episode, I'm going to turn it all around because the, the implication here is is there's politics and then, you know, there's the social, it's a little bit of an add-on and somewhere down at the bottom is the spirit and religiosity, as it were. But the politics is the main show. And in the last episode, I'm going to go, nope, let's swap the whole thing around and we're going to investigate the notion that unless we reconstruct what it is to be human, the politics is a waste of time. Just a undermine everything I've said <laughs> for the fun of it. Okay, I'll see you then. Bye.